Welcome to This Is Horror, a podcast for readers, writers, and creators. I'm your host, Michael David Wilson, and I'm joined as always by my co-host, Bob Pastorella. How's it going, Bob? I'm doing great, Michael. How are you doing? I'm all good. I'm excited to present to you the first part in our conversation with Gwendolyn Keist. And this is a wide-ranging conversation. We talk about growing up goth in the 80s. We talk about small towns. We talk about haunted stables. So an awful lot of interesting topics and perhaps things that you didn't think you'd hear about on a horror fiction podcast oh yeah there's a it's a wide-ranging conversation and uh just loved having her on the show um so so much so many directions that we went in it's just i think everyone's really really going to enjoy these i think so and i mean this is very much a conversation Perhaps even more so than a lot of these, because both of us really weigh in with our thoughts on various issues. So, I mean, if you're looking for a straightforward interview, this might not be for you. But hey, don't turn off yet, because you might like what you hear. Right. I would say it definitely, uh, you know, it, it, follow, it, it pretty much falls in the same format, but it was a conversation and a great one at that yeah i'm glad that i told people not to turn off because that could be a pretty big faux pas in the first minute of your podcast it's <laughs> just the podcasting mm-hmm. 101 don't tell yeah. your listeners to switch off yeah all right well before we get into the conversation let us have a quick word from our sponsors a satanic cult a woman's brutal assault Can Kirsty Thompson face her darkest fear before a demon from hell is unleashed? The Mark, by best-selling horror author Lee Mountford, is a haunting ghost story that will have you sleeping with the lights on. Available in Kindle, paperback, and hardback editions, as well as a high-quality audiobook produced by Hannibal Hills. Search for The Mark on Amazon and Audible now. Don't just read horror. Experience it. Introducing If It Bleeds by Matthew M. Bartlett, a new charitable chapbook from Nightscape Press. One third of all proceeds go to the Dakin Humane Society. A toe-tapping track from way back spreads like a virus through Leeds, Massachusetts, heralding a new era of unspeakable evil. WXXT, the slithering tongue in the ear of the Pioneer Valley. Are you ready to rock? All right, and we're back. I suppose what I should have said to open the conversation, to open the podcast with, is Happy New Year, because this will, in fact, be the first episode of 2019 that we're putting out. And, I mean, saying 2019 is something that I'm going to have to get used to. I nearly said this is the first episode of 2018. Yeah, I made a joke the other day about... uh having to, to learn how to write 2018 because I, I was just getting used to, after writing 2017 and I realized it's 2019. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like you always have this this whole thing, especially if you're having the date stuff and you have to write it. You're like, ah, wait, let me make that eight and nine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There you go. Now it's legal. Yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> That's it. So you can tell we're going to get into the big first world problems in this. Mm-hmm. Yes, definitely. But hey, yes. Happy New Year, everyone. Yeah. Happy New Year. Well, I believe, Bob, that you have Gwendolyn's bio. Yes, I do. Gwendolyn Keist is a speculative fiction writer based in Pennsylvania. Her work has appeared in Nightmare, Shimmer, Inner Zone, Daily Science Fiction, and Lamplight, among others. Her debut collection and her smile would untether the universe was released through Journal Stone in April of 2017. And her debut novel, The Rust Manus, was released in November of 2018. She currently resides on an abandoned horse farm with her husband, two cats, 
and not nearly enough ghost. And that is Gwendolyn Keist. All right. Well, without sad, let's not delay. Here it is. It is part one of the conversation with Gwendolyn Keist. And now for a horror interview. Gwendolyn, welcome to This Is Horror. Thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. Oh, and we're thrilled to have you here. I thought to begin with, if we could talk a little bit about what some of your early life lessons were growing up. Oh, that's a that's a big question, right? Right, uh, yeah. <laughs> for me, a lot of it, and I feel like this very much comes across in my writing, that being different sometimes can be very, very hard. And I, I grew up in a very small town and I was always, you know, the strange kid. And so to me, probably a, a very big early life lesson was having to keep going and, and getting through those things while still trying to figure out a way of, of being yourself and still loving the things that you love. Because, you know, being a, a kid in a small town, a lot of times you don't have a lot of other horror fans. You don't have as many as, as, as you hope. And as a girl, then it's like it's even weirder to be really into all this strange stuff that I was always into. And so it was just about learning to be like, this is what I love. This is who I am. And kind of going with that, even through maybe sometimes the rough times and, and through bullying and, and things like that. Oh, yeah. All of that that you're saying, I completely relate to because I'm from a small town in the Midlands mm -hmm. in England. And to be honest, it was pretty much me and my best friend who were into metal and horror and uh -huh. dressed like I dressed like a goth and he dressed like a punk so we had both subcultures <laughs> covered there <laughs> I love that that's great yeah yeah <laughs> but I mean on that note I mean when did you realize that as you put it you were the strange kid when did you realize that actually what you were into and perhaps even the way that you viewed the world was not the way in which a lot of people around you did I remember being about six I remember being on the playground and being like you know wanting to talk about something you know horror or just even like you said just the way you, you can see the world sometimes when you're a kid and then you try to share that with somebody and, and people like look at you like you know you grew an extra head or something and, and you realize this okay the way I'm seeing things isn't the way that other people are seeing things and so I remember being very young and I I remember also thinking like maybe someday this will be an asset that this will be something that will set me apart and so maybe it won't be so bad even if maybe it's not the the most fun thing right now so that i remember being very young and, and realizing that yeah and was there a moment when you realized hang on there are some other people who are a little bit like me and who are into similar things because i remember particularly when i was a teenager and i found like actually there are a whole societies like dedicated to rock and heavy metal and there are various different club nights and that was a game changer i mean admittedly i had to go to different towns there wasn't any in my small <laughs> town but if i traveled there were a few places where you know you'd meet like-minded people and then you get that sense of belonging and realizing either you're not that different or i am different but so are other people or even i'm different and that's okay i feel like as i got older you, like you said and you know you find people you know that I would find other people be into punk and goth music and it just sort of like almost like collecting people as you go along like you kind of like find people a few people in high school and so I had a bigger friend group then and then you go to college and you just keep meeting new people like you said most of the time you have to get out of the small town if you want to find a lot of these a lot of these things that might appeal to you but just over time finding like you said just people here and there and and being part of this group or being part of this and just realizing that also like you said that even if you are different that's okay that that can be something really really positive unto itself right yeah definitely did you ever like try and change your identity or did you want to hide it at all or were you very much about embracing it you know however people reacted 
I very much embraced it and probably sometimes was, was, was a bit much because of that. But sometimes I think, especially in high school, it was like, I'm just going to be absolutely ridiculous. I'm going to very much wear these ridiculous clothes, clothes that honestly probably were really ugly to be fair. And that I was like, I don't care. I'm going to go as extreme as I can. And that's who I am. And so I would probably take it way too far at times, but I didn't want to change who I was, no matter how hard that was. Yeah, but I I think that's an important part of the process. And I think probably up until 18 or maybe even 20, it was like, right, how alternative can I get? How many different <laughs> piercings can I get? How many clothes that basically look like bondage gear can I just wear to go to the supermarket? <laughs> and exactly, exactly. <laughs> there were things I wore to the grocery store and wore to the mall that now I'm like, I mean, it didn't hurt anybody, but wow, they were they were pretty extreme. They were pretty over the top. Yeah, yeah. You were shopping at Cinebite Express. You know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but like, I found as I've got older that it can be difficult to almost negotiate your identity and ground that with. I guess, like expectations within the workplace and within mm -hmm. society. And I do find that that is a dance and a battle that I deal with perhaps on a daily basis, because I mean, like, I want to obviously be myself. I want to mm -hmm. make sure that I'm being true to who I am. And I don't think it's fair that there are a lot of like jobs and a lot of people in society mm -hmm. who will judge you on appearance. But I think at the same time, you've got to be aware of it. So <laughs> I think it's really looking at how, how can I absolutely be me and not compromise being me, but at the same time, not limit my opportunities. Exactly. And I, I thought when I was younger, I'm like, if I can just get through this point in my life, it'll all be easier. And in some ways, things get easier as you get older. I still believe that. But you're right. Then you have more to lose once you once you get a job. In high school, it's like, you know, people are going to give you mean looks. And yes, there's peer pressure. And yes, there's a lot of things going on then that are very hard. But as you get older, you do. You want to be able to build a life. And sometimes the way that societal expectations are, it's like, nope, you can't look like that, can't dress like that, can't do this, can't do that. And so it does become this constant, like you said, negotiating of, of wanting to be true to who you are, but still wanting to be able to build a life. Yeah. And it's difficult mm -hmm. too, because if you conform too much, if you just become that mm -hmm. kind of ideal stereotype, well, mm -hmm. then, of course, people aren't going to accept people into alternative culture or mm -hmm. with alternative lifestyles because you're kind of um, compromising who you really yeah. are. So, you know, it's important for, for other people and for the future and for, you know, I guess, like changing societal expectations. Yes, yes. And I feel like that brings us back around to the horror genre so much because I feel like so much of, of the horror genre is about pushing at those at those boundaries and at those those, you know, societal stereotypes of what we're all supposed to be. And it, it's so transgressive at times that I, I feel like I feel like that's why when I think about horror, I always I always say in interviews or whatever, even just somebody's asking me about it, I always say it feels like home because yeah. it feels like a place where you can be different and, and that's not just okay. It's it's almost expected. It's almost expected that there's not necessarily going to be that same kind of conformity that that maybe other places in society or even other genres might have so i feel like that that that's very much one of the things of so many things that appeals to me about horror mm, yeah yeah everybody goes through those formative years especially when they're in school and you know it's like i grew up during the urban cowboy explosion it's like one day we were at school and it's amazing we all had on wranglers and cowboy <laughs> boots and i don't really know how it happened but i mean it's like everybody looked the same and you just and so and and i remember feeling i and, you know and i've i've worn boots i mean shoot I, there's probably some boots out there i probably want to buy you know but I would say that, you know, kind of like, I feel like Craig, uh, Craig Clevenger, you know, my style is like, you know, dirty Johnny Cash, you know. But <laughs> I like that. <laughs> at the time, 
So it was like, you know, and you had all these, you know, everybody was wearing these, you know, I guess they called them the brush proper shirts and all that. And, and, you know, growing up in the South, I mean, it's easy for people to get caught up in these trends, you know, mm-hmm. and there's people that still dress exactly the same way. I'm like, where do you find these clothes? At? <laughs> you have to get up at Goodwill now, you know, and it's like, I remember just, you know, it was like one day I said, you know what? I'm I'm not wearing this. I'm just not going to wear it. it. It's not me, mm-hmm. you know, and I put on my button ups and my desert boots and a polo shirt and went to school, you know, and I was like the only one who just, you know, was like wasn't wearing it. And, I, and I've, I've realized, you know, it's like in a, I got funny looks because everybody was kind of like, well, why are you dressed like that? You know, and I'm like, because this style never goes out of style, you know, or it, it did. But, you know, at the time, <laughs> it's just. I don't know. It's we, we all go through that to that stage and we all mm-hmm. find a way to strike out and become start to strike away and be an individual. Yeah, and absolutely. Yeah. I have to say, Bob, that Urban Cowboy Explosion would be a great band name. <laughs> as soon as you said that, it's like I'm writing that down. I'm not sure what I'm going to do with it, but. <laughs> I just love the way you put it. <laughs> yeah, there's some. Uh, I have some friends that were in a, a metal band, and uh, they weren't getting anywhere, and so they decided to to, you know, kind of strike out as as Texas Texas country, so they could play some rock and stuff like that. And it was funny because you know they had on the boots and the cowboy hats and everything. And uh, one of the things that they uh, would like to do is uh, remind everyone where they came from. So usually, you know, by the last part of, you know, they would take like a little break and play clubs and stuff like that. But there was always going to be a couple of metal songs. Hmm. And so you got these guys, you know, uh, they even had like a, you know, a fiddle player. So you got these guys that are, you know, wearing the, the, the long sleeve, you know, Western shirts and the Wranglers and the cowboy boots and cowboy hats out there playing Metallica, you know, <laughs> and it, it was just like, it, it's like a culture shock. And, but you know, the amazing thing is, is that they would put, make sure that they played a song that everyone could get into. And I don't even know what happened to those guys. I know they moved to Louisiana. I hope they're still jamming. I hope yeah. they're still jamming. Yeah. <laughs> Somewhere, somewhere I'm betting they're still jamming. Yeah. <laughs> it's interesting that they incorporated a fiddle into their metal <laughs> songs as well. That sounds great to me. Yeah. I love that. I think that sounds awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a little bit, I guess, like a heavier Jeffro toll. But <laughs> okay, okay. I mean, I, yeah. <laughs> but as, as Bob was saying that, I was thinking, yeah, I mean, that is true transgression that is true non-conformity so i think that kind of attitude does link back to what you were saying about horror and presumably from reading your work what you're looking to do with your horror fiction yeah that's that's definitely a, a thing whenever i'm i'm writing it's it's a huge theme i always go back to of this idea of of outsiders finding their place in the world mm. or in like maybe another world because sometimes there's kind of this I- idea that i always toy with of like of abysses or going into an abyss to, to try to find sort of where you belong so maybe not of this world but of some world somewhere to find find a place where where we all belong right yeah yeah And so I wonder, what were your first experiences with story and what were your first experiences with horror? My dad's a huge Edgar Allan Poe fan. And so he's been reading me Edgar Allan Poe from the time that my mom was pregnant with me. And so like that, that's been a thing that I, I grew up with. And so the earliest stories that I can remember were, were the black cat and the telltale heart and obviously poems like the Raven and Annabelle Lee. So both this with story and then also with horror, it sort of came together right away for me. And, and I think again, that was why it was, it was such a shock to me to kind of go out into the world because both my parents were into horror and then you go out into the world and a lot of people aren't into these things and it's suddenly so strange when in my in my house it was totally normal so that that's definitely where where I started with with storytelling my my mother was also a huge but both my parents actually were huge Brad Ray Bradbury fans and so there was a lot of Bradbury in the house and 
Yeah. So that was really where I started, like right away that the earliest things I can remember in terms of storytelling were, were horror stories. And both of my parents liked them. And, and I just thought they were, I always thought it was so cool. These things that could scare you, but then were also so beautiful. Cause I think both Bradbury and Poe write so beautifully. Mm. And, and I, that, that really appealed to me. Right. Well, Poe is amongst my favorite writers of that era and mm -hmm. I have a seven month old daughter and I have not yet started reading her Poe but if <laughs> your dad started when your mum was pregnant and that's it I'm gonna have a look for the absolute best Poe book that I can get I'm buying it her let's let's begin this journey tomorrow <laughs> yes do it that would be yeah. great <laughs> I highly encourage that. Mm. That's all we get out of this interview is that you're going to start reading your 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 baby girl Poe <laughs> right away. I'd say it's a good interview. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't yeah. even know how we're going to reach a higher point now. I mean, it's only about <laughs> twenty minutes in. Have we already peaked? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you you so you didn't you know in flash forward to the future when your daughter's in school and you have that first parent teacher and we'd like to show you some pictures she's drawn yeah. of, of someone being bricked into a wall yeah how strange and you'd be just have this this prideful smile on your face that would be less oh i'd love yeah. to be a fly on the wall to see that yeah <laughs> and then when we're home it's like now i told you you can't just go drawing that in school yeah. <laughs> at home by all means we'll frame it we'll put it on the wall but uh, keep it on the down low <laughs> we'll make prints and sell them but not at school yeah <laughs> oh. but what about the influence of film did that come into play um i mean i i'm i'm guessing that probably at six years old you weren't watching extreme horror films but then i don't know i think when we spoke with paul michael anderson he had a nightmare on elm street on at five years old so it could be actually i watched aliens for the first time when i was i think three wow we were oh my yeah, God. yes so i was really young because it was like my dad was on like a business trip and my mom and i went along and it was on the hotel like you know like hbo or whatever and i think my mom my mom was always trying to be the voice of reason and my dad was always like she'll be fine she can handle it and so we watched it and i remember i loved it so much because like there's newt so there's like a little kid in it that's like so there was kind of like this process that I could like relate to and I, I remember it really clearly even now like I'm 34 now so this is a long time ago now but I could still remember watching it at a very young age and like my my dad had me watching Hammer films from the time I was five or six so it's like not all Hammer films obviously some are a little bit more uh a little bit more sexed up so not those ones but like you know like horror of dracula i think i saw definitely that ending for the first time when i was very young so there was definitely always horror films playing in the house so some you know some kind of horror films yeah i wonder with aliens like how much you understood at three years old because i yeah, mean go, go exactly on. No, pro probably not a, a whole lot. Like you said, at three years old, probably not a lot. I could just tell that there was like these monsters and there's this little girl, but she's like kind of tough and kind of cool. Like, I think I understood enough of that to be like, this is really interesting, even though, you know, again, how much did I really understand? Probably not, probably not a lot of the nuances for sure, but. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and it's kind of funny that as you, get older you'll probably find that you're more scared or you're more affected by the quieter horror and the psychological horror mm -hmm. and horror that kind of works by implication and through what mm -hmm. it doesn't show whereas mm -hmm. when you're younger it's probably going to be that more visceral horror slashers and just uh -huh. gore on the screen so weirdly enough if you watch the things that will really affect you when you're in your 30s but as a kid you probably <laughs> might even find them a little bit boring <laughs> it, 
It, yeah. Very much so. I, I completely agree with that. Because that's something that any anytime somebody asks me, you know, what kind of horror are you into? And I'm like, you know, I'm as an adult, I'm much more into kind of that Shirley Jackson style of horror, that it's much more of the horror of human beings, the horror of being part of society that 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 can be very stifling. Whereas, yeah, as, as a kid, when you're really young, you want that like you said, more visceral horror, the things that are more immediate, that are more visual. Whereas as you get older and you sort of understand the world better, it becomes, you know, that more unsettling, that quiet horror that can really get under your skin. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's probably because a lot of our concerns and what we're Mm -hmm. scared of change as we get older. So obviously as a kid, like, someone turning up with a chainsaw and killing you is probably about (laughs) as bad as it's gonna get but then when you're older it's like oh what what if my entire existence is pointless and I'm not being the person that I should be what if I'm just irrelevant what if I'm isolated Mm -hmm. you know Mm -hmm. (laughs) like kind of existential crises (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. That, that's the stuff that now that I'm older that really, really freaks me out. Like you said, I, I always joke on on Facebook or on Twitter about existential dread I, I, to the point that I'm like, it's probably too much that I'm always joking about it. But it is something that like living in this world and, and it has become an increasingly oppressive world in many ways. And that becomes such like a daily horror that's so much scarier than like you said, like somebody with a chainsaw or somebody, you know, you know, these these very visceral, visual things that terrify us so much when we're younger. And obviously, I don't want to be chased with a chainsaw now either. But as, you know, from, from, from the <laughs> Just to clarify. Of, uh, yeah, yeah, just, just to, clarify. to clarify. Nobody come, no come, nobody come chasing me with a chainsaw. <laughs> that would still be scary. But just that thought of, of the pointlessness of things or, or, or that fear of, of what what it all means in a society that can be so oppressive is is so much more terrifying and so much more enduring, I guess, because like somebody with a chainsaw, once they're stopped, they're stopped. Whereas this idea of living in an oppressive society is something we sort of have to face day after day. So it's it's just something that keeps going that never really feels like you have a place that it's like, okay, we've we've gotten rid of the killer and everything's good now. It's like, eh, that's not gonna be so easy. <laughs> Right, yeah. And I think to continue the chainsaw analogy, which I'm sure people are loving, I mean, if someone (laughs) turns up with a chainsaw, you either survive or you don't. It's very quick. But if you have this epiphany Mm -hmm. that your life is meaningless and on the grand scheme of things, you are nothing and nothing that you do really serves Mm -hmm. any purpose. Well, that could be Mm -hmm. something you have to now live with that realization for 70 years. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. (laughs) It's like we get this as we get older, we gain this experience. So like, you know, the visceral things, the things in our interface are scary, you know, and it's like exactly what you're talking about. I didn't really appreciate Thomas Ligotti's work until I got older. And Mm -hmm. so and now it's like I can read a Ligotti story and it's just like, oh, my God, it's just fucking, you know, and I'm going to have nightmares now. You know, and it's stuff that I would have read like 20 years ago and been like, well, I didn't really get it. <laughs> Where's the monster? <laughs> you know, and it's like, where the monster? Ah, you know, <laughs> so it's like, you get this realization, you know, and it's just, I think you, there's a certain level of maturity. And uh, for some, it comes later. For some, it comes early, you know, but mm-hmm. you know, it's compared to surface horror. That's what I kind of mm-hmm. call that stuff. It's like, it's right there in your face. It's on the yeah. surface. You know? I like that. I like that surface horror. I think that's really, that's really interesting. I don't think I've ever heard it called that before, but I really like that because that's a, that's a good description. This idea that, you know, it's just right there. It's all immediate, but then, Mm. you know, there's the kind of horror, the quieter horror that that kind of gets more like deeper. I like Mm. that. Yeah. And I think with surface horror, which I'm going to totally steal as well now, (laughs) I, I, I think like it can get to a point where it's like, all right, this is peak surface horror i mean particularly Mm -hmm. if you go down that torture porn route that's Mm -hmm. kind of an end game there's a bit where it's like well it's not gonna get much more fucked up than this but if you're (laughs) asking deep existential questions i mean the deeper you go the deeper you go you can just ask more and more questions and it's seemingly never ending yeah 
exactly. There's, there's, there's no place where you're going to be able to stop, stop asking those kind of like philosophical or existential questions about, about who we are and, and the horrors of life. Right. So yeah. 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 yeah I like that. What you want to find is uh, to me, some of the most enduring works are works that have, you know, the both aspects, they have that in your face mm-hmm. and they, they mm-hmm. ask the question, like the thing, you know, yes. it's a great example. You yes. know, it's like, you've got this, this entity that can imitate life and wants us to die. And then you, you, at the same time, you're like, am I who I think I am? Mm-hmm. You know, is, is everyone else? So, you know, this, that sense of paranoia, it just mm-hmm. comes so naturally. So, you know, that's, you know, I, I think that's why, you know, a lot of us gravitate to that because it's got both kinds, you know? Yeah. And, uh, yeah. It's, it's, uh, and I lost my train of thought, but yeah, you know. No, what I mean. no, I, I think that was <laughs> that was a really good point, Bob. And I think Gwendolyn yeah. mentioned Shirley Jackson before, mm-hmm. and I think mm-hmm. the lottery is a great example of that because yes. on the surface mm-hmm. it is a brutal stoning, but all the societal and the philosophical questions mm-hmm. that are then raised as a result of that story. I mean, you can look mm-hmm. at it on both levels and. My goodness, if you want to get the most out of it, you need to look at it on all these exactly. levels. Exactly. It, it works best when you look at it with, with both that surface horror and, and, and that deeper existential horror. I love that you brought up the identity issues in the thing, because I think that that's, so, that's such a huge part of that movie. Like you said, it, it's such a visually terrifying film. But at the same time, this idea of, of who am I and who are the people around me and are we who we seem is, is such like a really... A, a very terrifying question, just as terrifying as the monster itself. So I like that you brought that up. Even if you did lose your train of thought, it's fine. Like you, you already said everything that needed to be said there. You, you already got me <laughs> thinking more about the thing again because I love that movie so much. Yeah, it's like in, when you combine that with you know Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Mm-hmm. Yes. And it's you know it, it's to me it's like that that there's that undercurrent that that's. That at the same time it becomes surface. You know what I mean? It's you know, and that's the most one of the most chilling scenes in the world to me is in, you know, the invasion of the body snatchers when Donald Sutherland is on the phone and he goes, How did they know my name? You know, and I'm just yeah. I mean, that scared the shit out of me. I was just like, Holy the first time I saw it, I was like, Oh my god, they know, you know. And it's like who but but who are they? You know, and mm-hmm. but am I part of they, you know, and then and it's like and then of course, you know, seeing the thing and I you know, strangely enough, I saw Invasion of the Body Snatchers before I ever saw the thing. Uh because I had a friend who saw a bunch of horror movies and basically wasn't really a horror fan, just said that was kind of dumb, you know. <laughs> You know, it's like, you know, so now, and then, of course, he moves away, you know, so if I ever find him, we'll punch him in the mouth because <laughs> the great, you know, great approach, taste. Rob. <laughs> I love Invasion of the Body Snatchers as well. I actually like both the original version and the, and the Donald Sutherland remake. I think that they're both like, they explore the same types of themes, but I think they do it in, in different ways, and both are oh, yeah. very, very effective at it. And mm-hmm. I actually think I, I found the remake more unsettling, mm-hmm. especially that ending whenever she comes up to him. I mean, I, I think we can spoil the movie. It's like a million years, like what, like yeah. 30, 40 years yeah. old now? <laughs> but at the end, and she thinks he's still him. Again, these issues of identity, she goes up to him because she thinks that he's pretending like she is, and then it turns out, no, no, he's one of them. And that, that was just... That that really got to me. That was terrifying whenever I was mm-hmm. a kid and saw that. That was terrifying. Oh, yeah. And it's, you know, people, say, people try to the cornhole, you know, they put it into like this hole in the corner of science fiction. And it's, it, yeah, it kind of is, mm-hmm. but it, it's horror. You know, yeah. I mean, there's, there's no doubt about it. Yeah, absolutely. I think like science fiction horror, like that, that subgenre, which is kind of a subgenre of both really kind of gets overlooked that people either want to say no 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 that's science fiction or it's horror but i i think it's really a great subgenre i was just talking with someone about that recently about how i i love that and again that's aliens that's the thing that's invasion yeah. of the body snatchers that's a, a mm-hmm. number of the movies we've already been discussing so i love that i love that subgenre so much but mm-hmm. i feel like people are like you know want to claim it as one or the other and i'm like it's cool that it's both it's it's great that it's both <laughs> right. it brings the best of both genres to the table 
Yeah. And then you throw the fly in there, then you have oh, transformative, gosh. you know. Yes. I, I love I love the remake of The Fly much better than the original Fly, The Fly, mm-hmm. which some people I, I I've had this conversation I think with my dad because like I said he's a huge horror fan he's like I like the original and I'm like I like the Cronenberg because I think the Cronenberg has more of those questions of of identity and mm-hmm. and and the tragic love story between between Gina Davis and and Jeff Goldblum is just like heartbreaking and I I, I remember feeling a lot more affected by by the remake than I was the original the originals the originals fun. But like I would never describe the Cronenberg version as fun. It's great, but it's not fun. It's it's very dark, and and I I love body horror. That's that mm-hmm. comes up in my work a lot. And so that 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 film just I, I didn't see it until I was like well into adulthood. I think I was like thirty before I saw saw the fly the remake for the first time, and I was just like wow wow this is mm-hmm. this is definitely a movie. I'm I'm glad that I I finally saw. Yeah, but it's probably good, like, coming back to what we said before, that you did mm-hmm. see it when you were a little bit older, because, uh, mm-hmm. again, if you'd have seen it more on a surface level, you probably wouldn't have, like, mm-hmm. tapped into those questions of identity as deep as you did. Yeah, and I think, actually, it made more sense, because I saw the original The Fly as a kid, and that seems more like the type of surface horror that we've been discussing. And so I think that was probably the right time to see that one, and then to see the remake when I was older was probably the right time to see that in terms of being able to, like you said, tap into those to those themes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, as you may know, as you've listened to a number of our conversations before, I do like to... You know, really dig deep when I'm even looking at someone's bio. And there's a couple of things that (laughs) stood out for me. So there's a line that says, you currently reside on an abandoned horse farm outside of Pittsburgh with your husband, two cats, and not nearly enough ghosts. So we've got a few questions. So... (laughs) I just want to know more about this abandoned horse farm. You know, first question is just who abandoned it? Do we know why did they abandon it? So as much detail on that as possible. And not nearly enough ghosts would imply that there are, in fact, some ghosts. So we're talking about that, too. Okay. Well, honestly, the the first the first part is probably not nearly as interesting as I make it sound. The people who owned the property before us had horses here whenever my whenever my husband bought it because he he already lived here when he and I met. Truly, the horses just moved down the street. Like we can pass them. They have another horse farm down the street. So this one was just abandoned basically because we bought it. But we we have a lot of like we have like the troughs and we have a lot of fencing and you can see where the horses were. And so when I first got here and my husband's explaining it to me I'm like oh it's like it's like an abandoned horse farm and my husband's always like it's not abandoned we live here and I'm like it's an abandoned horse farm and so but somebody else is just talking to me about this and they're like it makes it sound like the horses just took off one day yeah. I'm like yeah, yeah. And they, they didn't they just moved down the street like they're, they're, they're fine the horses are fine so the way, it, the way it sounded to me it's like the owners just took off one day and left the horses yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> like, hey, I'd have been like super cool with that, you know. I'd have been like, hey, you know what? I don't know much about horses, but I have a phone and I have internet, and yeah. I'm gonna love them just like anyone else should. <laughs> right? Yeah, it's kind of like in so many horror films where there's a ghost attached to the house, and it's like, yes. well, we'll give you a good price on this property because it comes with a load of fucking horses that were just <laughs> abandoned. So, you know, we can knock twenty five percent off. If you will look <laughs> after the horses. <laughs> See, it's not nearly that interesting, but <laughs> maybe you could say that next next time, just with a straight next face. It's like next you time. know. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the story with the horses. I believe the horses. I, I mean. Although my husband's lived here now for like 17 years, so perhaps the horses that lived here have gone to what the the big stable in the sky at this point. But I, I believe they lived out the rest of their lives happy and healthy down the road. So they're, they're yeah. fine. <laughs> <laughs> and the not nearly enough ghosts. Yeah, I feel like it's a little bit haunted. It's maybe a little bit haunted on the property. Maybe. I, mean, I, I don't know. I like to believe it's a little bit haunted. So we'll, we'll say that. I, I would like it to be slightly more haunted, but, you know. Maybe with horses. Maybe the horses can come back. Maybe if they, maybe if they did uh, go to the big stable in the sky, they can come back here. They can come back here. We can have right. a haunted horse farm. I, that's cool. I'd, I'd be good with that. Yeah. 
<laughs> well, I mean, I'm not going to stop questioning the ghost element just yet, so you haven't got away <laughs> that easily. So. I hope not. I hope not. <laughs> what, what I'm wondering then is in terms of the supernatural, in terms of ghosts, in terms of other like life forms within that spiritual dimension what are or aren't your beliefs oh wow wow that that is a very deep question I well i mean we've already done existentialism yeah, so now right. <laughs> might as well let's, yeah. let's do it absolutely <laughs> I do. I think I, I believe in, in, in the idea of energy being left left behind. I believe in, in that kind of ghostly uh, ideas. I do. I, I'm, I try to keep a very open mind about things. I feel like that's where I come with a lot of my beliefs, that it's just I just have an open mind about, about what, what's all out there. I don't, ever want, I don't ever want to close myself off to possibility, and that's sort of like generally speaking, even beyond maybe spiritual questions of wanting – to believe that there are things out there that, that we as human beings don't understand yet, or that at least me as an individual that maybe I don't understand yet and, and leaving myself open to those, to those possibilities, I guess. So that that's probably where, where I, where I fall on that. Mm. And you said that you like to believe that the horse farm, the abandoned horse farm <laughs> in which you live is, a, you know, a little bit haunted. There's something going on. Are there any strange experiences or things that you felt or seen? Actually, when I was writing one of the stories for my collection, and it was this really just strange experience all the way around, like, at one point, like I, I walked down the hallway and I turned and there was just like this strange like pillar of light that just kind of stood there. And then just as I was watching, it slowly dissipated. And because the, the it was the title story in my collection and it was this really, really strange experience writing it to begin with, it, seeing this ghostly pillar of light at the end of the hall, I'm like, yeah, this is totally on par for what this experience has been like. There was like no like, like I wasn't unnerved or, or fearful or anything. I'm like, yep, yep, this seems like completely on par with what would happen during writing this story and then it just was gone and i haven't seen it since so right. I mean, that, you know so that that's i don't part of me is like the, the skeptical part of me is like you were probably just tired like you were probably overworked and tired and that's probably what happened but the other part of me is like hey you know what i don't know i don't know what it was i'm, I'm leaving myself open to the possibility of what it was right and i think it's you know interesting and just damn fun to muse on the possibilities mm -hmm. it's like was this just a spectral presence that saw that i was writing my first collection and was like yep you're doing well this is what you were born to do gwendolyn i just wanted to give you the nod and now i'm out of here <laughs> i love that that's great <laughs> <laughs> but i mean on the note of writing, when did you first start writing stories and when did you realize that this was something you wanted to do with seriousness and that you wanted to have your stories published and to be read? I started writing when I was really young. I mean, again, my parents were really into literature, both of them. So it seemed very natural to them, you know, especially as a kid, you, you want to create the things that you're seeing around you. You want to, you know, try your hand at them if, if you really like them. So I feel like I wrote some of my first stories probably when I was like four or five, six years old. I used to like make these little books and badly illustrate them because I was never very good at like drawing, but I would illustrate them and like staple them together and have my parents, like I would have little book sales that my parents would come and buy the books from me <laughs> for like a dime or a quarter or whatever. And so I, I did write for a long time when I was younger. I wrote a lot of, you know, little fiction uh, stories here and there. And then I got into high school and I, I middle school and, and I just realized that I wasn't ready for the rejection. I was in a writing competition and I lost and I did not handle it well at all. And I was like, oh, I'm, this is not probably going to be a good field for me. So I actually got away from it for a while. I became a filmmaker for a while and I was writing screenplays. And so that was still, I was still able to write. And then 
I kind of burned out on the filmmaking. I always say like I was, wasn't a very good director. I was just kind of mad at my actors all the time. And that was like horrible. And I'm like, I do not want to be this person who's like this really mean, like I used to say, I'm like, I'm like Ridley Scott, but not with the vision of Ridley Scott. Cause Ridley Scott always had that reputation for like yelling at actors. And right. things. I'm like, I don't, I don't want to be like this. I don't want to be like this anyways, but I don't even have as good a vision in terms of like filmmaking and, and like, translating it to screen and so i i went back to the idea i'm like you know let me see what if i if i can if i can go back to fiction writing and this was about six years ago now and i still wasn't sure if i'd be able to handle the rejection i'm actually always very proud of myself that i can handle the rejection a lot better than i felt i felt i could definitely when i was younger but better than i even sometimes feel i can now I'm like you know I'm, i do okay like it's it's not so bad i can survive it it's better to be creating something you're proud of even if you know you suffer the rejection along the way so that that's kind of the long you know way around to to coming back to fiction writing but that's that's pretty much what happened. I, I did it when I was younger and I, I liked it, but then I just was not ready for, for a career in it, I don't think, when I was younger. And I I kind of came back around to it and I'm, I'm pretty happy with how it's going so far. Oh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I'd imagine so. And I suppose if you ever want to get back into directing and filmmaking, I mean, take that Ridley Scott thing and use it. Brand yourself. Be bad Ridley, not a division. <laughs> All of the anger. <laughs> See if people will sign up to that. Yeah. <laughs> my, but, my dad has actually pointed out that, like, Ridley Scott, I think, has actually calmed down from the things I've read as he's gotten older. Like, I don't think he's as Ridley Scott as he used to be. So. Yeah. Just, like, maybe, de maybe. just deny that. Start making up Ridley Scott stories. It's like, no, no, no. Yeah. That's what you think. This is what he did. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> Do you feel that whenever you were doing that and you said you were writing screenplays, obviously, do you feel that writing screenplays, starting with fiction, going to screenplays, and then going back to fiction, do you feel like that, that helped you as far as your fiction writing? Yes, I very much think it did because it, it forced me, even though, again, like I said, I didn't feel like I could get it from page to screen as well. A lot of times it was budget limitations and sometimes it was just limitations because I don't feel film. I love film so much, but I don't feel like it's my medium. But I do think that it did help me with being able to try to, to work with a story more like I'm imagining a film. And so that makes it more visual. That sort of forces me to, to pull out some of those details that, that can be visual uh, and which is so strange to say because really it's not necessarily visual for a reader, but that's how I, I conceptualize it as these things that we can very easily see and creating the worlds in that way and seeing them kind of play out like a film as I'm writing them. So I, I do feel like it's helped. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think, I mean, there's a reason why a lot of the books that are recommended to writers first starting mm -hmm. out, even people writing just regular fiction, writing prose fiction, are some of these books on screenwriting because mm -hmm. I think they really do just get back to the basics of story. So I think mm -hmm. a good approach for people starting out is pick up one of these screenwriting mm -hmm. books by people like Sid Field or Robert mm -hmm. McKee. And then also, if you want to do something a little bit more artistic and really play with words start um analyzing and uh critically breaking down poetry and if you do mm -hmm. that you study poetry and you study screenwriting i mean i would think that you're gonna not only come up with great stories but stories that have that literary and that artistic flourish and i mean that's certainly mm -hmm. how i describe what you're doing and particularly the rust maidens which we'll certainly get on to <laughs> i like the idea of also uh, recommending poetry i think that that's such a that's such a wonderful dichotomy between screenwriting and and poetry but i i agree i think putting those two together for for fiction writers is actually would be very very helpful especially for people just starting out, but even for people, you know, I mean, I go back to poetry all the time and I go back to film all the time to, to really see and, and get a different feel. And if you're feeling stuck at some point, that can be a great way to break out of it. 
Mm. And so since we're talking about poetry, I mean, I'd love to hear about some of the poets that you gravitate towards and so some of the poets that you'd recommend our readers seek out so i mean how about if you tell us let's say three poets who you read for completely different reasons so who's the poet what's a book or poem you would recommend and why does this poem this poet appeal to you well, we've already talked about him, but I, I feel like I have to say it again. Poe, Edgar Allan Poe. I, right. I feel yeah. like that's, yeah. that's just, it's such an obvious one. But at the same time, I feel like that's, that's, he's been so essential to my life. And if I only picked one piece from Poe, it would have to be The Raven. I mean, mm. I love The Raven. It's, it's, it's this beautiful, almost lullaby. It almost has this kind of nursery rhyme sing song, but it's so creepy and it, and it's so haunting and there's so much melancholy in it. But again, it's also a story. It's very much a story unto itself. Some poems aren't, some poems are more just feelings and that's fine too. It's just sort of capturing that, that, that feeling in time. But I, I love the Raven because it captures that emotion, but it also captures the story. So that, that's a huge one f for me. And, oh, wow. I would, I, again, this one's probably so obvious, but I, I love Sylvia Plath. Mm. I, and she's, she's a sort of the opposite from Poe in that regard, that so much of, of her work is, is, about, is about feeling. And it's, it's maybe not so much a story, but at the same time, you almost feel like you're being taken on a journey. It may not be a specific story that's got a linear plot, but you do feel this journey, this very clear emotional arc when you read her work. And... Oh, wow. There's, there's a lot of stuff from her. I love the poem Lady Lazarus. There's a, there's a lot of there. I like some of the mythology that she brings into it because I was very into mythology when I was a kid and, and she, she can bring some of these things, these kind of like Phoenix from the ashes kind of feel to her work. And it does feel so mythic. So that that's another big one. And if I'm going for a third poem, because you asked for three, right? That's right. Yeah, All here right. we go. I'm, <laughs> Number I'm three. Gonna, <laughs> I'm going to go with a modern writer who just had a book come out this year, Claire C. Holland. She had a book that came out of poetry called I Am Not Your Final Girl. And all of the poems are from perspectives of final girls in horror. And it's really, really just beautiful beautiful book of very unnerving poetry that she's got and they're not all like traditional final girls even though you have someone like laurie strode from halloween but you also have rosemary from rosemary's baby and anna from possession and you have a lot of these these some of them are much more mainstream horror some of them are are things that you know i have been out for years that are more cult horror and it's very feminist it's it's very powerful and yet it's it's very much in, in a, in a traditional horror, uh, cinema, you know, horror film vein. So th those would be the three. So Edgar Allan Poe, Sylvia Plath and Claire C. Holland. I would say those are the three that I would recommend. Yeah. That collection, I am not your final girl. I saw that pop up on Twitter recently. And I mm -hmm. mean, obviously the title immediately <laughs> caught my attention, mm -hmm. but I mean, this is something that I've definitely got to pick up i mean it does sound like it's going to be original it's going to be interesting and it's hopefully mm -hmm. for a lot of people going to be really thought provoking yeah there and there's just some really beautiful pieces on that that she's very much capture some of these these feelings that that i th i think a lot of us have shared in in watching these films and just seeing it winnow down into a poem and that that's that's such a I love horror poetry because in many ways it, it feels like something that almost shouldn't exist, that, it, uh, that we don't normally think of it. We think horror stories, we think horror film, and then horror poetry, and yet at the same time it's been something that's been with us, like we said, since Poe, since before that. But we tend to think more horror stories, ghost stories being told around a fire. We don't usually think, oh, we're going to recite a poem now. A lot of people don't think poems are scary. That's not usually the kind of like knee-jerk reaction to poetry, and yet I think when you do have a horror poet who knows what they're doing, I, I think that there's almost nothing as powerful as that because it's so few words to capture so much. Mm, yeah, I, and I think what you're saying, it probably does come down to a misconception as to one, mm -hmm. what horror mm -hmm. is, and two, yeah. what poetry, what poetry is. is. So, exactly. yeah, you combine the two, and I, I can certainly see how 
if you just glanced at it, you would think, oh, is that an oxymoron? And it's like, well, no, it isn't. And it has existed <laughs> pretty much as long as we have. Exactly, exactly. But I think that the way we're sort of brought up to think about poetry isn't in that way. It's in this much more, you know, kind of conventional literary way, which, granted, there's some conventional literary poetry that I love, too. So that's in no way, you know, saying anything bad about that. But I, I don't think that horror poetry is something that a lot of people immediately think of when they think of horror or, like you said, when they think of poetry. But I do think that they work so well together because, again, I think poetry can be so visceral. It can be so baseline emotions or more complex emotional journeys. And either way, that's very much something that, that horror does as well. Right. And I mean, I think poetry can and is used as a political tool and a way to show mm -hmm. that you're angry at the system, which I think in a way goes back to horror anyway. It's just a little less obvious. I mean, both um, mm -hmm. kind of the beat poetry and the political yeah. poets and even political hip hop artists that we have at the moment are doing a very similar thing two horror writers they're looking at the establishment and looking at the mainstream and exposing it for what it actually is not what it purports to be exactly exactly i do i do feel i do completely agree with that this idea of of it being so easily turned toward the political and it it it's so concise and i do love that about poetry and and like you said it's so it's such a great idea to recommend it to fiction writers, because there's definitely times that I think all of us as fiction writers could be more concise, that it's not always using more words is better, and, and poets very much have to, at least usually. There are obviously epic poems, but most of the time it is this idea of, of really being concise and getting to that point where, where you can say so much with so few words. Yeah, and I think even in epic poetry, every line has to count i mean yes of course yes. like in fiction every line should count should but count. I, I i i feel <laughs> just from the form of poetry that there's a pressure that it it has to it yes. has to add meaning where you know yeah like i say it should in fiction but yes. you're not gonna get a story rejection if there's a mm -hmm. few lines that aren't really you know, furthering it in the way in which a poem would. Yes, I would agree. I would agree with that. So I do feel like that. That's that's great advice. I love that. That is definitely something I'm going to use in, in the future of being like, I've talked about screenwriting to people before about how that has helped me, but I'd never really thought about how poetry, like recommending that to, to fiction writers. That's good. I like that. I think that that can be very helpful. Mm, yeah, yeah. And I know that you mentioned mythology and that being of interest. And recently you were on the Ladies of the Horror Fiction podcast and you were talking yes. about folklore. So, I mean, first of all, I'm going to recommend that everyone listens to that. I'm not going to tread the same ground because it's out there. You've already recorded it. You've already answered it. If you want that, then, you know, click in the show notes. But don't do it now. Wait for the conversation <laughs> yeah. to end. You don't know where we're going to go. Um, you be careful when you say that, Michael, because people just do what you tell them to do. Yeah, yeah, I do have that power and great responsibility <laughs> comes with it. But something that you said during that conversation was this idea of podcasts being the new mm -hmm. sitting around the campfire mm -hmm. and talking with one another. And I know that Lisa Quigley from Ladies of the Fright mm -hmm. mentioned that to me and it really resonated with her. So, I mean, when did you start thinking about podcasts in that way and were there particular ones that I, I guess kind of lit up that idea in you and I'd just love to hear a little bit more on that thought. I remember it was probably three four years ago and when I was really looking at getting published as a fiction writer and really starting to look at different markets and how at first I was like okay I'm I'm you know 
I can be conventional at times as much as I talked earlier about, you know, I'm, I, I try, I'm, I'm different, but then at the same time, like, you know, I'm used to literature being something that is written down. And so when I was first looking at markets, I was like, Oh, but you know, if it's on a podcast, like a fiction podcast, then it's not going to be written down. And then I listened to some and I was like, wow, this very much feels like in this old tradition that, you know, I always think about again, people around campfires, you know, people in front of hearths telling ghost stories, especially around this time of year around, you know, moving towards Christmas, that used to be a tradition in, in a lot of places. And and I, I remember realizing how much it for me personally it tapped into something that felt very primal and, and this idea of hearing stories aloud. And I had gotten into the habit of reading my own work aloud to see how it sounded. And so then I realized this very much comes back to this idea of, of hearing stories told aloud and how much and even as children you know, we hear sto- many of us hear stories told to us by by our parents. And so it also goes back to this this feeling of comfort that many of us can have, you know, with those childhood memories. And then again, in this thing that's been a long tradition. And and I one of the ones I always go back to that I really love in terms of fiction podcasts is the Wicked Library. I've always felt that they they do some really, really great work over there. I've had a number of my stories there, and I just love listening to anything that they do. And it, it's also fun hearing a story told aloud that you've already read, that you've already had that kind of conventional experience with it of, of reading the printed word and then listening to it, it can be a totally different experience. And I've even had that happen with my own work that then I'll, I'll be very familiar with the story. I wrote it, I've seen it published other places, and then it'll be on a podcast like the Wicked Library and I'll hear it again. And hearing somebody else take different moments or take different beats in a story or the way they interpret it, even though it's the same words, it can feel totally different. And I love that about podcasts. And I love that about just the oral tradition of how the exact same words, the exact same story can come across so differently depending on who's telling it. And that can be such a really interesting and fun experience. Yeah, and I'd certainly second the Wicked Library. And I think as well, another one, in fact, which you've had tales uh, published on, or certainly a tale, is Tales to Terrify. Yes, yes, they're they're fabulous too. They're they're another one that I discovered very very early on because they've been around for a number of years. They just, have, they have, they have, they really have. And so that was that was great, just being able to go through their their archives because they have so many stories that they've done, and that that was really exciting too. I remember they were one of the first ones. I think I might have even discovered them before I discovered the Wicked Library. Now that I'm now that I'm thinking back to it, and they they're really great. Yeah, yeah. I think another two that I listen to a pseudopod mm-hmm. and also th- this one's quite a recent one the other stories and the other stories uh, are a british podcast and okay. i guess what they do is usually more um i guess like maybe more straightforward horror is the best way to put it but they really have great audio production values and you'll get a lot of sound effects and they'll really elevate the story so that that's a good one certainly to listen to and then outside of genre absolute classic but the new yorker fiction podcast and then you get that analysis at the end as well so i mean you can have things like alice munro discussing nabokov or something like that (laughs) i've never listened to either one of those last two you just talked about i'll have to look into that i didn't even know the new yorker did a did a podcast (laughs) they do yeah that there's a couple that they do so there's new yorker fiction podcast which i've been Mm -hmm. listening to for a long time now and so what they'll do is they'll get a current writer in and then they will Mm -hmm. choose a story by another writer that has previously appeared in the new yorker and then they will read it aloud they will narrate it so i mentioned the lottery before Mm -hmm. there is a podcast with a.m holmes who wrote the end of alice reading the lottery by shirley jackson and then discussing it afterwards very cool. Okay, I'll have mm-hmm. to I'll have to check that out. That sounds really neat because that was, of course, the story I immediately thought of. But I'm like, oh, they choose old New Yorker stories. I I'd want to do the lottery, and then you bring it up, of course, because <laughs> yeah. it's so good. That's like that's like my favorite New Yorker yeah. story. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> and then there's another New Yorker podcast that is much more recent, because I think the first one I mentioned has maybe been about as long as Tales to Terrify, but there's another one, I think it's just called New Yorker Voices, and so then that's more current stories, but then it is read uh, by the person who wrote the story. Okay. And Very cool. Yeah, I think they also give a little bit of insight into the story after. And I mean, I'm all over that because I love story notes. I hit love hearing yes. writers discuss their work. I mean, you'd hope so because I host This Is Horror Podcast. <laughs> if I was like, oh, one thing I don't like is when writers are always bloody going on about their work. <laughs> it's like, well, why have you done <laughs> 250 episodes of this <laughs> it's like oh I, I just hate myself it's part of that existential crisis we spoke about <laughs> I'm just punishing me <laughs> so I recommend those there's no question attached to that <laughs> recommending them and I'll put them in the show notes for everyone that sounds very cool I will definitely check that out mm-hmm. Thank you so much for listening to part one of our conversation with Gwendolyn Keist. Join us again next time for the second and final part, but of course, if you want to catch it ahead of the crowd, you know what to do. Become our patron, and for just a dollar, you're going to get to hear that before everybody else. You are going to be amongst the first to hear that. But that is not the only reason to become a patron. Oh no, we have a lot of reasons. We have a lot of perks at different levels. So at the $1 level, you can submit a question to each and every interviewee that we have on the show. And we have so many conversations coming up. We have conversations with Sarah Langan, Elizabeth Hand... Eddie Generous of Unnerving Magazine, Doug Morano, Lauren Bucus, Keelan Patrick Burke, and many, many more. You also get to listen to Q&A sessions with myself and Bob Pastorella, where you can really ask us anything, whether it is on writing, publishing, life, it is anything goes. Now, last year, we were aiming to hit 200 patrons, We didn't quite get there. We got over 150, so we were tremendously proud of that. Unfortunately, as is the case at the start of the month, it has dipped a little bit. I mean, that is the nature of the game. People come and people go, but as long as the patrons are going up, generally, that is the main thing. And I've been speaking to Bob about our goals for the year and our goal For the year after, in fact. So I've been saying that I'd like to reach 1,000 patrons by 2020. And I feel that I'd like to readjust that. And I mean, that's the thing with goals and targets. We readjust based on how we're doing and based on the personal circumstances. And, you know, I'd like to have 1,000 patrons within 2020 but I think to say by 2020 it might be overstretching ourselves so what we're gonna do is we are looking to get 300 patrons by the end of the year so by the 31st of December 2019 and then By the end of 2020, so the 31st of December, same day every year, to have a thousand patrons, I think we can do it. I think it is something that is achievable. I know that if we gain 10 to 15 patrons every month in 2019, then we can get 300 patrons by the end of the year. And... You know, with 300 patrons, with more content, with conversations with some of the best, like Charlene Harris and Steve Rasnick-Tem, 
I think it will stand us in good stead for a thousand patrons within 2020. So that is the challenge that's been laid down. Please, if you have a dollar, do join us at www.patreon.com forward slash this is horror. All right, let's wrap up with a quick word from our sponsors. Introducing If It Bleeds by Matthew M. Bartlett, a new charitable chapbook from Nightscape Press. One third of all proceeds go to the Dakin Humane Society. A toe-tapping track from way back spreads like a virus through Leeds, Massachusetts, heralding a new era of unspeakable evil. WXXT, the slithering tongue in the ear of the Pioneer Valley. Are you ready to rock? A satanic cult. A woman's brutal assault. Can Kirsty Thompson face her darkest fear before a demon from hell is unleashed? The Mark by best-selling horror author Lee Mountford is a haunting ghost story that will have you sleeping with the lights on. Available in Kindle, paperback, and hardback editions, as well as a high-quality audiobook produced by Hannibal Hills. Search for The Mark on Amazon and Audible now. Don't just read horror. Experience it. Now, ordinarily, I would wrap up with a quote, but I found an article on Writer's Digest by... Rachel Skeller, called Five New Year's Resolutions for Writers. And I thought I would read the five to you. And of course, if you want more detail, then do Google that Five New Year's Resolutions for Writers on Writer's Digest. So here we go. Number one, I resolve to make time for writing. Number two, I resolve to embrace my personal writing style. Number three, I resolve to self-edit as I write. Hmm, not sure I'd do that one. I just like to get the draft down, but hey, that is why it is Rachel Skeller's and not my article. Number four... I resolve to step outside my comfort zone. And number five, I resolve to call myself a writer. I gotta say, with the exception of the self-editing, I think those are all great bits of wisdom that work for me. And, um, you know, number three could work for me, but... I know what I'm like. If I self-edit as I go along, then I'm going to be very, very slow because I will self-edit that same sentence uh, on Monday and on Tuesday and on Wednesday. And I know for my own personal style and the way in which I approach it that, damn it, I just need to get that first draft down. But hey... Maybe self-edit as I write is exactly what you need to do. And so experiment and remember in terms of writing advice, in terms of any advice, your mileage may vary. Okay, I will see you in the next episode with Gwendolyn Keist. Maybe I'll see you on Patreon at www.patreon.com forward slash this is horror. You'll help us reach 300 patrons. By the end of the year. But either way, I hope all of your writing goals are met. I hope that your new year is off to a wonderful start. So, take care of yourself. Be good to one another. Read horror. Keep on writing. And have a great, great day.